G'day everybody, welcome back to Laws 13010 Evidence and Proof. I'm Anthony Marinak and this week with the Topic 9 lecture we're going to conclude our study of the hearsay rule which has uh, taken us three weeks. We're going to look today at a grab bag of different exceptions to the hearsay rule. Um, these are all uh, exceptions that have developed over time through the common law and which probably don't have any real unifying idea behind them but uh, they're all exceptions that you need to know and understand. You remember from previous weeks that the hearsay rule says that evidence is inadmissible if it is evidence of a third party statement that was made outside the court. However, as we've seen over the last three weeks, that basic statement of the rule is subject to a whole bunch of exceptions. We've so far learned about exceptions in relation to credit evidence, evidence in, exceptions in relation to confessions, and exceptions in relation to admissions, and this week we'll learn about the rest. So first we're going to look at uh, the hearsay exception which applies when the original witness is deceased. Then we're going to look at what's called the res geste exception. We're going to look at an exception for contemporaneous statements and finally we're going to look at what's known as the telephone rule. And at the end we're going to look at how the uh, hearsay exceptions that we're describing today are treated under the Uniform Evidence Act because in some ways they're treated quite differently to uh, how they're treated in Queensland law. So let's begin. Let's start by looking at the, the uh, exceptions that apply in relation to deceased witnesses. Now you'll remember that part of the rationale for the hearsay rule is that it's not fair to use evidence against a party if they don't have the opportunity to cross-examine the person who made the original statement. Now that leaves us in a really unusual situation where the person who made the original statement is dead. Because on the one hand of course there is no way to be able to cross-examine the person who made the statement because obviously they're dead. On the other hand, it's still kind of unfair to hold that evidence against a party when the party doesn't have the opportunity to cross-examine. So nobody's really going to be happy. So the law's developed some rules that say the circumstances under which the law is prepared to accept the statement of a deceased witness in exception to the hearsay rule. The first one is where the deceased person made a statement against their own pecuniary or proprietary interest. So if the deceased person made a statement which at the time they made the statement they thought would cost them money or would cost them property. So if for instance they agreed to pay a bill or they agreed that they were liable to buy something for someone or that they'd made a certain promise that they intended to be held to. Any of those statements are against the person's pecuniary or proprietary interest and they're likely to be held against them. Now, strangely enough, this rule doesn't extend to statements against other forms of interest. In particular, it doesn't extend to statements against a person's penal interests. So the mere fact that something is likely to, to, to uh, cost them in terms of their legal position doesn't make this a statement against their own interests. The only interests that, that matter are a person's pecuniary or proprietary interests. Can you explain why? Because if you can, please email me. I don't quite understand why um, the law has limited it to just against uh, pecuniary and proprietary interests either. I suspect that this is just one of those accidents of history that come up um, in the common law from time to time. There is an important consequence though. Because you can't accept a statement by a deceased person which is contrary to their own penal interests, you can't use these forms of statements in criminal trials. So this first exception, statements by a deceased person against their pecuniary or proprietary interests is only available in civil trials. The next sort of statement is a statement under duty. If the deceased person had a very clear duty to make certain observations and report them, 
those observations would be admissible. So there are two aspects to this. There must be a duty to do a particular act and there must be a duty to then report on that act after it's been done. You really don't see this one used very often because those parameters are actually quite tight. Actually, they're really tight. And the best way to see how tight they are is to consider the case of the Crown and O'Mealy. O'Mealy was accused of killing a police constable, shooting a police constable. Once the police constable had been injured, other police attended on him. At this point in time, he still believed he was going to pull through. He still believed that he was, uh, he knew that he was very badly injured, but he thought he was going to end up being okay. He knew who'd perf who had, um, uh, who had committed the offence against him, and he told other police who it had been. He later died. The court held that this was not a statement under duty, because although the constable made the statement in the course of his duties, he was not under a specific duty to report that person's name back to the police, and therefore it wasn't a statement under duty. It's pretty hard, really, to think of circumstances under which a person really would be under a level of duty that would make this exception apply. The only one that I can come off come up with off the top of my head would be if you had a teacher who had become aware of or had strong suspicions about um, abuse in relation to a child under their care who informed the principal of their suspicions and then got hit by a bus on the way home that night you suspect, I mean, I would suspect that that would be a statement under duty for the purpose of evidence law. But this is really, they're really quite tight parameters around where it can be used. And you're probably seeing that pattern already because both of the exceptions that we've now looked at in relation to deceased persons have quite tight parameters around when they can be used. So you can see the court trying to deal with that balancing act that we talked about at the start between saying, well, we can't cross-examine this person because they're dead. But on the other hand, the other side really ought to be able to cross-examine. So you can see they've limited the use of the uh, statements by deceased persons. The third exception in relation to deceased persons does get used quite a bit. And this is what's called a dying declaration. In criminal homicide trials, only criminal homicide trials, the statement of a dying victim identifying their killer is admissible despite the hearsay rule. The reason for this is that it's held that at the time that they made that statement they had no reason to be lying because they, they knew that they were about to die. A dying declaration can only be used if at the time the person made the declaration they held no hope whatsoever of their own recovery. If there is any evidence at all to show that they believed they might pull through, it's not a dying declaration. That's why in O'Mealy's case that we discussed a few moments ago, the police constable was not a dying declaration because he believed he was going to pull through. Just a couple of years ago, in 2010, the South Australian Supreme Court had to look carefully at dying declarations in a case called the Crown and Buzzacott. What had happened was that Buzzacott had stabbed um, another man in the course of a knife fight while the two of them were intoxicated. The other man had then gone home and said to various of his me members of his family that Buzzacott had inflicted the wounds upon him. But at no time did he give anybody any indication that he expected to die. He was taken to receive medical attention and later died. Even though he had very clearly identified his attacker to a number of people, it was held that all of these were hearsay because at the time that he made these statements, he had no understanding that he was going to die. And therefore, the conditions which the court believes cause people to tell the truth, i.e., the fact that they can have nothing to gain because they're about to die, didn't pertain because the person believed that they were going to survive or believed that they might survive. Now, I've, said in the, I've asked on the slide there, are you comfortable with this rule? Is it the case that a person who has just received a mortal wound is likely to give reliable evidence? Personally, I'm not convinced that 
A person who's in that level of distress and who believes that death is imminent may well have many types of things going through their mind. And we can't ask them to come back and put context around their statement. So for me, a dying declaration would have to be given in the clearest possible terms to be taken as evidence by the court. But it is open to the court to accept a dying declaration despite the hearsay rule. Um, the final type of, of exception to the hearsay rule relating to statements by deceased people is what's called a testamentary statement. Testamentary statements come up in cases where a will is being contested. Where there is a contest over a will, statements of the testator can indicate what the state of mind of the testator was at the time they made their will. Now, for those of you who haven't done succession law, this might be difficult to get your head around. The evidence can only be used to indicate the testator's state of mind. It can't be used to override the actual provisions of the will. If there is a will in existence, then that will is what the court will enforce. But there are some circumstances in which the state of mind of the testator, that is the person who's, who made the will, can be relevant to whether the will should be, um, should be executed or not. So for instance, if there's a person who believed on good grounds that they would be a beneficiary under the will, and then the will comes out and they find that they're not a beneficiary under the will, the state of mind of the testator can be important because the court will determine did the testator actually deliberately decide not to give this person anything or were there circumstances in the testator's state of mind that made them simply omit or forget or unreasonably refrain from giving that sort of a gift. Let's have a look at the case Hughes and the National Trustees. Now look, this is quite a complicated case to read um, and uh, if, if you do read it, it'll probably get your hackles up in the way that it does mine because I think the case had the wrong outcome. But what had happened was that uh, Mr. Hughes had been living on his father's property for many years because Mr. Hughes was essentially a layabout. He was unable to um, hold down a job and so instead he ran an unsuccessful farm whilst living on his father's property rent-free. His father indicated to him that eventually the property would be his anyway. The father died and uh, Mr Hughes's mother um, started getting on in age and she came to live with Mr Hughes and his de facto wife. The mother and the wife didn't get along very well at all and in the end the mother moved into a residential aged care facility, indicated to everybody that she didn't like um, her, husband, her son's um, wife at all and uh, she then... Um, died and her will gave the substantial portion of her estate including the farm uh, to um, a charity. Hughes made a claim under what's called family provision legislation which is that where a person is unable to fend for themselves economically then their parents have a responsibility to uh, leave appropriate amounts of money for them in their wills. Strangely enough, this can be applied even to somebody like Mr Hughes who was in his 40s at the time that his mother died. The court found in the end that statements which Mrs Hughes had made before her death about the distaste that she had for her son and his wife were relevant to reading the will, even though they were hearsay. However, on other grounds relating to family provision legislation in New South Wales, the court found that Mr Hughes was entitled to keep the farm. Had that family provision legislation not been in existence, her statements about the reasons why she made her will the way she did would have been admissible, despite the hearsay rule. So that's how a testamentary statement works. Now, I want to switch for a moment from the common law as it applies in Queensland to the Uniform Evidence Acts for a moment. Because the Uniform Evidence Acts deal with this whole question quite differently. 
The Uniform Evidence Acts have rules for witnesses who are unavailable. So this is not just deceased witnesses. These are witnesses who might be unavailable for any number of reasons. So um, they might, for instance, be incompetent to give evidence, whether temporarily or permanently, or they might be um, away from the jurisdiction to the point where it's not going to be reasonable to bring the person before the court. In those cases, for first-hand hearsay only, Statements by that unavailable witness may be described to the court by a person who saw or heard or otherwise perceived the representation being made. So basically, it, it's almost as though it does away with the hearsay rule altogether for first-hand hearsay where the witness is unavailable. So there's none of these finicky rules that we've been discussing for the common law. In the criminal law, the same conditions are imposed and there's a couple of other conditions that I'll uh, leave for you to have a look for yourself in uh, Section 65 of the Evidence Act. So the bottom line is that under the Uniform Evidence Act, under the Uniform Evidence Act, where a witness is either deceased or otherwise unavailable and where the hearsay is first-hand hearsay, it's quite likely to be admitted. The rules are much more generous in the Uniform Evidence Act jurisdiction uh, than they are in the common law jurisdiction. So that's statements by deceased witnesses. Now we're going to turn to res gestae. Res gestae is, is a Latin term meaning, meaning things done. Statements which are res gestae are part of the action. It's almost impossible in some circumstances to describe what went on without being able to refer to the things you heard. So if a person walks into a bank and as they walk into the bank they're flung down by two people running out of the bank and one of those people shouts, I've got the money, let's get out of here. It's not really a hearsay statement, is it? It is a hearsay statement because the person who got flung to the ground is describing the words that were said by someone else but in reality all they're really doing is saying what happened it's not a description afterwards about what went on at the scene of the crime so to speak these are words that are actually said as the whole thing is going on they're part of the story part of the action and it's impossible to sensibly describe the action without including those words in the case Adelaide Chemical and Carlisle, Mr. Carlisle was uh, was severely injured um, and eventually died as a result of exposure to sulfuric acid. He um, got the acid on himself and shortly afterwards was describing to his wife what had happened. And the question that came before the court was whether or not the res gestae exception applied, whether or not this was happening, whether whether this was part of the uh, of the action, or whether this was a discussion afterwards about what had happened. What the court found in Carlisle's case was that because he'd gone home almost immediately and told his wife about what went on, his statements to her were so close to the events that they could be fairly regarded as being part of the action. So, if a statement is part of the action then it's likely to be res gestae. Now there are a couple of specific aspects of the res gestae rule um, which will make it easier to work out whether a, 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 a statement is res gestae or whether it's not. The first type is where the words accompany and explain the action which is underway. In the case the Crown and Benz, a mother and daughter team had just killed the mother's de facto. And they were in the process at about 2 o'clock in the morning of lowering his body over the side of a bridge at a place called Mundulan, south of Brisbane. And they were actually discovered by a security guard who was on his way home after finishing a shift at the casino. They had lowered the body into the river, but they were halfway across the bridge and he slowed his car down and asked them if they were okay. The daughter said, yes, we're okay, mum's just feeling a bit sick. They were later arrested and 
the statement of the driver was admissible to show the relationship between the mother and the daughter because she had said mum's okay it was regarded as res geste because it was a statement which accompanied and explained what was going on at the time of the offence so they were involved in the process of heaving this guy's body over the side of the bridge when they were discovered and made this statement so it accompanied and explained the second type of res geste is where a statement was made by a participant in the event and it's so clearly made as part of the event that the possibility of concoction can be disregarded. The case everyone calls on for this is called Ratten and the Crown. In Ratten and the Crown, um, a murder occurred or was alleged to have occurred in, in the town of Echuca in northern Victoria in the 1970s. The, the murder was essentially a domestic violence case that went to its uh, furthest extreme and after the, the, uh, the wife in this matter had been shot and killed the husband claimed that he had been cleaning the firearm and it had accidentally discharged killing her. The thing is that prior to her dying she had called the local switchboard and asked to be put through to the police. The switchboard operator said that she had difficulty understanding the lady because she was screaming in hysterical tones. She wasn't able to put the lady through to the police and a short time later the lady was found dead. Now you can see that if the gentleman concerned was actually just cleaning his firearm and there was an actual discharge there was no reason for his wife to have been screaming hysterically into the phone and asking for the police. The two stories just don't go together. But because her statements, the statements of the victim, were so clearly part of the action, they were so clearly spontaneous, there was so clearly no possibility of them having been concocted. The evidence of the switchboard operator was admitted despite the hearsay rule because the switchboard operator had effectively become a participant in the events um, which which constituted the crime and the statement was made by a participant in the events and there was absolutely no prospect that it could possibly have been disregarded. The next type of res geste exception is a statement which indicates a person's contemporaneous state of mind. In other words, a statement that's made by a person which indicates what their state of mind was at the time that they committed certain acts. Now, because you've all studied criminal law, you will know that a person's state of mind is often very important to their liability for a criminal act. Some acts can be quite innocent if done with certain frames of mind, and yet those same acts, if they're done deceitfully or in order to seek an advantage or in order to cause harm, can constitute criminal offences. A statement which indicates a person's state of mind at the time they committed certain acts can be relevant evidence. The case that we look at here is a case called Bull and the Queen. It's a 2000 case that eventually made its way um, to the High Court. In this case, a um, woman received a phone call late at night from a friend of hers. The friend of hers was at his home with a group of mates, all of whom had been drinking and smoking marijuana for much of the evening. And he spoke to this uh, woman on the phone, and in the course of their conversation, he invited her over. And she was reluctant to come over. And in, as part of enticing her to come over, he said to her, if you come over, we might be able to organise one of your fantasies. She had previously indicated to the man that one of her fantasies, one of her sexual fantasies, was to have sex with a group of men. She went over to the house shortly afterwards. This was in the early hours of the morning. And she later made a complaint of rape in relation to the men. It was held that her statements on the phone and the man's statements on the phone relating to 
the likelihood that if she came over, she would able, be able to participate in what was her fantasy of having group sex with men was indicated, or it was allowed as evidence to indicate what was her contemporaneous state of mind to show that part of her state of mind at the time that she turned up and the time that she came over to the house was that there was the possibility of having sex with a group of men. Now, obviously this doesn't mean that she consented and it doesn't mean that she couldn't withdraw consent at any time and um, having the fantasy of having sex with a group of men doesn't necessarily mean she was consenting to having sex with this particular group of men. Um, but the, the fact that she had come over after that conversation was clearly relevant to what her state of mind was when she turned up. It's not necessarily um, conclusive evidence, but it's, it's, it's clearly relevant. And so it was allowed um, as an exception as part of the res gestae because it was, it was part of the action. Finally, the final type of, uh, of res gestae exception that we talk about is immediate sensation. If somebody screams out, ouch, or if somebody is running and they shout, he's trying to get me, those things are statements of immediate sensation. Now, statements of immediate sensation need to be handled carefully because they can only tell you about what the person's feeling. They can't tell you anything about what caused it. There's a beautiful old statement in the Crown and Nicholas, which I've put on the slide, it's an 1846 case, where the court says, if a man says to his surgeon, I have a pain in the head, that is evidence. But if he says, I have a wound, and was to add, I met John Thomas who had a sword and ran me through the body with it, that would be no evidence against John Thomas. So, they can a, per, a person can give evidence of their immediate sensation, so how that hurts, and that's an exception to the hearsay rule. But once they start trying to say what happened to cause whatever it is that hurts, that goes beyond immediate sensation, and it's just plain old hearsay, and it, gets, it, it doesn't qualify for any of the exceptions. So if a person walks in to a doctor's theatre and says, I've got a terrible pain in the stomach, the doctor might later be able to give evidence that they had said that, because it was an immediate sensation. So that's res gestae. Next I'd like to talk about the exception for contemporaneous thoughts and feelings. Now you'll see the very first line on the PowerPoint slide, and I've even put it in red text, is fair warning, this gets a bit confusing. Because this exception is very similar to the res gestae exception for contemporaneous feelings. The difference between the two is that this exception occurs when an unavailable witness makes statements outside the context of the event itself, but those statements are still very relevant to the event itself. Now, I've got to tell you that I struggled myself to understand this for a long time until I really sat down and read Hendry's case. I'm going to try and explain it to you now, but then I want everybody to really have a look at The Crown and Hendry because it's a great case that explains this exception. In The Crown and Hendry, a woman was found strangled in her bedroom. When the police investigated the scene, they found signs of a struggle in the bedroom. She'd really tried to throw off the attacker but they found no signs of struggle anywhere else in the house. So somehow this attacker in the middle of the day had managed to get inside the house, get to the bedroom, get her to the bedroom, and then a struggle had, had ensued. It didn't make any sense. They were trying to work out how this could happen. Eventually, they arrested a painted decorator for her murder. The husband of the victim then gave evidence that in the days beforehand, she had been discussing employing this decorator to renovate the bedroom. This statement was admissible to show why there may have been no struggle elsewhere in the house because the painted decorator was invited into the bedroom. It's just that he was invited into the bedroom for the purpose of um, talking about painting and decorating. 
rather than for the purpose of raping and murdering her. Now what you can see is that her statements to her husband that she was thinking about getting the decorator in did not occur in the course of the action. There's no way we can describe these as being part of the action. So they're not res geste. But they do explain what her contemporaneous thoughts and feelings were. They do explain why she took this strange man into her bedroom. So it's a statement which is an exception to the hearsay rule because it shows the contemporaneous thoughts and feelings. So how do you deal with this? Well, if you've got something that you think is a statement of contemporaneous thoughts and feelings, you ask yourself, is this fairly happening in the, con in the course of the action? If it is, then the relevant rule is the res geste exception. If it's not, then the relevant rule is the exception for contemporaneous thoughts and feelings. Please go have a look at Hendry's case. It will make this much clearer than I can in just a couple of minutes of speaking. And these two concepts are very close. The only distinction between them is whether the, event, whether the statement happens in the course of the action. Finally, I want to talk about the telephone exception. The telephone exception is a, an exception that has only been around for about 20 years and it only seems to exist in Australia. The idea is that if one party to a telephone call identifies the person they've been speaking to, this can be admitted as evidence of the proof of the identity of the other person. So if I'm on the phone to Jill and I, I get off the phone and say to the person who was next to me, that was Jill on the phone. The evidence of that person that I'm speaking to could uh, would be admissible to prove that I was talking to Jill on the phone. It's a bit of an odd one. And uh, it came up in the case The Crown and Pollitt. And the, the, the case shows the rule quite well. Let's talk about the case and then we'll talk about whether the rule's convincing. Pollitt's case, Pollitt's case is an awesome story and I, I, I love the story and I love how completely inept Pollitt was, but I have to be careful about saying that because the dude's still in prison and who knows, he might come after me. Pollitt was an exceptionally inept contract killer. He was allegedly given a contract by um, an underworld figure to kill somebody for $5,000. Pollitt turned up and shot the wrong guy. Killed the wrong guy. The next day... Pollitt allegedly got on the phone to the person who had hired him to do the job and demanded the payment anyway. The person that he was speaking to, of course, was not terribly amused and uh, an argument ensued on the phone. He hung up the phone. Uh, the the, the uh, person who'd hired Pollitt hung up the phone, turned around to his wife and said, essentially, that was Pollitt on the phone. This was taken as evidence that he had actually been having a conversation with Pollitt. The telephone exception is very rarely argued and, uh, and may have actually just been uh, one of those one-offs, but it does seem to have created a rule which is still on the books. I'm not sure how convincing the telephone exception rule is for a couple of reasons. One is that there's always... Um, the possibility of impersonation. Two is that the rule was created in 1992. Now, for those of you who are a lot younger than me and who have difficulty remembering back as far as 1992, 1992 was around about the time that um, car phones and personal mobile phones were just starting to become um, available for people who had a lot of money. Mobile networks were very, very limited and very, very expensive. Probably at that point in time, 95% of telephony was still fixed line to fixed line. That's the circumstances when the rule was made. Nowadays, everybody is carrying a phone on their person at virtually all times, and there are new technologies such as SMS messaging, which was simply unheard of in 1992, 
the nature of telephony has changed so much in the last 20 years that it's almost impossible to see whether how Pollitt's rule could still be applicable. Things like caller identification was um, it was just fantasy in the early 1990s. It was not a technology that was uh, that was really even comprehensible. Um, the idea of putting a trace on a phone to find out you know which number was calling was still very big in police uh, TV dramas back in the early 1990s. So whether or not this rule is one that is going to last the test of time is really highly dubious. But as it stands, the telephone exception is still there. Most of the time though, I would say you can find better evidence. Now that is the end of the exceptions that relate to the common law rules. I want to take a few minutes though to talk about um, exceptions that come out of the Uniform Evidence Act. Most of the stuff in the Uniform Evidence Act is pretty similar in its effect to uh, the common law, but there are a few things that we need to know that are different. And the first is Section 60. Section 60 states that if evidence is introduced to the court for a non-hearsay purpose, it will be available subsequently also for hearsay purposes. Let's unpack that a little bit. At the start of our discussion about hearsay two weeks ago, we talked about hearsay and non-hearsay uses. Remember Subramaniam's case. In Subramaniam's case, his statement that the bandits had said, we are Chinese communists and we will kill you if you don't come with us, it was admissible to show that he heard those words and regarded them as a threat. It was not admissible to prove anything about the people who said it. So there was a hearsay and a non-hearsay purpose. What section 60 says is, if you introduced that statement for the non-hearsay purpose of saying, these are the words Subramaniam heard and he heard them as a threat, as soon as they're validly before the court as evidence, we well, can do what you like with them. So you could then ask the court to interpret those words as being evidence that these guys really were Chinese communists who were out to kill him. So once the evidence is before the court, it can be used for any purpose, including a hearsay purpose. Now that rule has no equivalent in the common law. This is something that they've come up with brand new for the Uniform Evidence Act. The judge still retains the discretion to prevent this Section 60 use of the evidence if the judge feels that the prejudicial value of the evidence outweighs its probative value. Now, how do you feel about Section 60 now that you've, you've got virtually a full understanding of hearsay evidence? On the one hand, you could argue that Section 60 just reflects reality, that once a jury has heard certain evidence, the jury is likely to use it for both purposes anyway, so we may as well just accept that reality and allow it to happen. On the other hand, mightn't it be the case that particularly in criminal trials, Section 60 exposes a defendant to a new and pernicious sort of evidence that they previously wouldn't have had to face? Isn't Section 60 like waving a red rag in front of lawyers and saying, if you can find some sort of way to introduce this evidence for a non-hearsay purpose, then it's open slather as far as hearsay goes. Now, so far, in the, in the nearly 20 years that we've had the Uniform Evidence Act at the Commonwealth level, we haven't really seen open slather in that way, and judges have been pretty seems that judges have been pretty good at applying that prejudicial and probative balance, which I suspect is what the legislators were hoping for when they put it in in the first place. But I still think there's plenty of room to bring a critical approach to Section 60, and to ask whether Section 60 might have the effect of injustice by allowing hearsay evidence to be used without qualifying under one of the normal hearsay exceptions. The final difference that I want to talk about with the Uniform Evidence Act is that 
Under the Uniform Evidence Act, if a party intends to rely on a hearsay exception, they have to give notice to the other party first of what the evidence is and that they intend to advise on a hearsay exception and they have to explain which hearsay exception they intend to rely upon. So the other party can consider whether or not to run a voir dire to try and have the evidence excluded. Unlike Section 60, I think this requirement, which is in Section 67, is an excellent requirement, which I, I think we could validly u um, introduce into a common law state like Queensland, because it is in accordance with justice, and frankly it's in accordance with plain common sense to have parties required to inform other parties uh, if they're going to be doing anything unusual in terms of evidence law. So. Um, if you are operating in a Uniform Evidence Act jurisdiction and you do intend to rely on a hearsay exception, you are going to have to follow whatever the rules of court are for that particular court about providing notice to the other side that you intend to rely on hearsay evidence. So there we are. Over the space of three weeks, we've gone into hearsay in quite a bit of depth. We've looked at what the hearsay rule itself says and we've looked at the various exceptions which really bring the hearsay rule to life. Today we've talked about hearsay exceptions that allow some deceased uh, witnesses' statements to be admitted. We've talked about the equivalent provisions in the Uniform Evidence Act which relate to unavailable witnesses. We've talked about various aspects of res gestae, the res gestae exceptions which apply to words which were part of the action. We've talked about statements which are not res gestae, but which nevertheless demonstrate the thoughts and feelings of the witness. That's Hendry's case. And finally, we've talked about the telephone exception, which allows the identification of a party to, the tel to a telephone call. And we've wrapped it up with some additional provisions under the Uniform Evidence Act. Hearsay is probably about as complicated as it gets in terms of evidence law. It is a complicated concept, mainly because of the number of exceptions that have to apply, and as you've seen, sometimes there are exceptions to those exceptions. I have to give credit, though, to some um, students in the United States of America, because they took the American hearsay exceptions, which all apply under Section 806 of the relevant law, and they enacted those hearsay exceptions using Lego characters. And so instead of sending you to Hollywood this week, I'm going to send you to YouTube and ask you to watch what these American students came up with. Bear in mind that it's US law rather than Australian law, but it's actually pretty close. I hope you have as much fun looking at it as I did, and I'll look forward to talking to you again next week uh, when we'll talk about opinion evidence. <laughs>